Welcome to City Showcase on City TV. I am Nana Majimanasante, and today I'll be speaking to one of the world's best philosophers and a leading thinker, Professor Kwame Anthony Apia. He is a Ghanaian, an Asante royal, and a global citizen. Professor Kwame Anthony Apia teaches philosophy, philosophy and law at the New York University in New York, in Abu Dhabi, and other NYU centers. I think there's one in Ghana. But those are not the only things that make him special. His parents, his father was a very prominent Ghanaian. The late Emmanuel Apia, popularly known as Joe Apia in Kumasi, was a lawyer, a politician, a member of parliament, an ambassador and president of the Ghana Bar Association. His mother, British, Peggy Apia, was a writer and she was a British royalty as well. I wonder what all that means for a philosopher who reflects on identity, race, and politics. Um, beyond thrilled to be here to speak to Professor Kwame Anthony Okay, so Prof, thank you for having this conversation with me. Um, first of all, I have to ask about your name. So I... <laughs> <laughs> so it's um, Kwame Anthony Akroma Ampim Kusi Apia. Yes. I know that Akroma Ampim is your family line name, but is it intentional that the Kwame comes before the Anthony? So all those names are Ghanaian, even though the Anthony doesn't sound Ghanaian. So, <laughs> so Kwame is, of course, I was just born on a Saturday. Um, and Anthony is really Antoni. And Yao Antoni was the head of our family before my father, so I was known for him, uh, named for him. And then Akraman Pim is kind of the first head of the family, so I was named for him. That's, he, he lived in the early um, 18th century. And, um, and then Kusi is a name that goes with Apia. <laughs> <laughs> So that's how I got them all. But so it's mostly, it's, it's my, apart from my day name, it's, my, it's two of my, my, uh, my father's uh, maternal ancestors. Okay, I know you grew up here. How does it feel to be back? Great. I mean, I, I, I should say that here for me means Kumasi because... Yeah, here. So, <laughs> because I didn't spend a lot of time in Accra when I was a kid. I did. Uh, teach at Legon for a year, so I was living just outside Accra for a while. But this was in a pretty difficult time in the economy. In the 1970s, I didn't have a car, so I spent most of my time on the campus at Legon, oh, okay. which was fine. I had a good time there. Uh, I got very thin because I didn't get a huge amount of food on my salary, uh, but, but I had a terrific time. And that was really what persuaded me that I wanted to go back and get a PhD and become a professor. Oh. So I, I know you, you say home is Kumasi. I, I, I Google tells me you've been made a chief. Yes, summer. indeed. Uh, just now, this summer, I became um, a, uh, you know, Kuswo, uh, any. Yeah. Uh, chief of progress. Chief of progress. Yeah. So I like that. I'm a progressive chief. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, so I'm Nana, Nana Jemfi. Uh, yeah. Akroma Pim. Pim. Yeah. Because that's the... That's the, where the village, who, he founded the village, Gusahani. Um, uh, so, um, and that was quite moving. We had never been to my father's village before. While my father was alive, he didn't want us to go there. He was trying to sort of separate from them, not because he didn't like them, but because he, he wanted them to be less dependent. I think, on him, on yeah. Him. And um, so, uh, he talked about it and he wrote about it in his autobiography, but he didn't encourage us to go there. So this is actually, he's been dead for a quarter of a century. It's the first time we've been. Oh, okay. So this was special. It was special. All my sisters came from where they live in England and Nigeria and Namibia. And, uh, and uh, the, um, one of my brothers-in-law and a lot of my nephews and two of my nieces. So it was good, it was nice. We had a very interesting time and the village was incredibly welcoming and though we hadn't been there, especially the older people had known about us all along apparently. Yeah, they always do. So they, because uh, I do remember, it's the place is called Nyadum and I do remember people coming from there to our house when we were children yeah, in Kumasi. 
I see. So you grew up here. I, I just um, right after independence, that period. I wonder what it was like to be living in Ghana. To be what? Um, so we came. My father was a law student in London uh, until um, early 1954, I think. I was born in, in 1954. They were married in 1953, and we came home when I was about one or so. So uh, from 1955. Um, we lived in Kumasi, and so I'm older than Ghana. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, 57 was yeah. independence. Um, so I, I had an interesting... So it was an interesting time. Obviously things were changing. I, 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 was, I got more aware of it as I grew older. Obviously when I first came I was just an infant. Yeah, just a baby. Just a baby. But, um, no, it was exciting I, I, because uh, so my, my father had been a very close friend of Kwame Nkrumah's in London and he was going to be best man at my parents wedding but then he became the leader of government business so he couldn't come so he sent George Padmore who was a, another pan-Africanist to represent him um, so they had been very close when my father came back and he went to Kumasi and talked to his family and, and, and the Asantehini and the people around the Asantehini because he's sort of related to them by marriage, um, he decided to join the opposition. So he ran for parliament in the first uh, yeah, election. In and, Achuma, and then see, yes, yeah. stand by Lake Basumtree. Yeah. Uh, very hard constituency because you have to walk up and down <laughs> to the villages. You have yeah, to walk, walk down to the down. lake and then up yeah. again. Um, so it kept him very fit. <laughs> so he went. He, he was represented them, and then, um, and then in the you know when the first round of political arrests happened uh, in '61, he was imprisoned for a bit, and that was a tough time for my mother, obviously because you know she was she wasn't Ghanaian. She wasn't Ghanaian, and actually she thought she was Ghanaian. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, she thought, I, I married a Ghanaian. I'm Ghanaian. I'm Ghanaian. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but they tried to, they were going to deport her and various they other were. things. They yeah. were. And anyway, so not a good time. And one of the, the stories about that time, which affected my life, was that uh, when, um, when Queen Elizabeth I, II uh, and her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, came to Kumasi with Nkrumah um, in the early 60s, um, I was in hospital and, and she came by my bed and she said, you know, how are you? So I said, I'm fine. <laughs> was, you know, what, what are you supposed to say if you're in bed in hospital? Yeah. I, I was getting better. Um, but when they were walking away, the Duke of Edinburgh turned around and said to me, give my regards to your mother. Oh, how did Nkrumah take that? He hated it. He was, <laughs> he, because he hadn't realized they knew that they were talking to the child of somebody who was in political prison there. Yeah. And then he realized they did know. And he, he, you know, in the books about him, the, his doctor said that he had a runny tummy for several days oh. after that. He was really, you know, my doctor was fired, uh, the head of the hospital. He was fired? Mm, he's moved on. So, uh, and there was a lot of coverage of this episode in the international press. So my mother wisely um, wrote to my grandmother and said, I think I'm going to ask Sen Kwame to be with you for a while because, you know, I don't want the president to be focusing on us. So that was why I ended up going to school in England was because uh, it was a, my father was in prison and my mother was being harassed a bit. Well, that's, that's interesting. So I know your, your mother was British, your father's Ghanaian. It was an interesting time in 1953 for a black man to marry a British woman. And then you lived in Ghana a bit and then lived in, went to school in the United Kingdom. I wonder if all of that inspired this career in philosophy. You know, it's very interesting. My father was, uh, because of the, the wedding was quite widely covered in the press in London, because my mother's father was in the, was in the British government. Um, uh, as soon as I was born, people asked my journalists, asked my parents, you know, what's he going to do? <laughs> and, you know, I'm like this. I'm, I'm about that big. <laughs> and you might think the answer would be wait and see. Yeah. But my father, who, who was never at a loss for words, 
said, well, maybe he'll be a doctor and he'll go to Cambridge University, or maybe be, he'll be a philosopher and he'll go to Harvard University. Oh. And so, uh, though I don't, I, I don't think that ever influenced me very much. I don't think I even knew about this, but it is true that I went to Cambridge University to study medicine and I ended up teaching philosophy at Harvard. Wait. So my father, <laughs> my father was prescient. He was able to see the future, apparently. Oh, you studied medicine before. Yes, now I went to Cambridge to do medicine. Because I'd very sick as a child, that was why I was in hospital when the Queen came. I, you know, if, if you have a good experience with a doctor, that's an obvious thing to do. And if you say you want to be a doctor, everybody says, yes, that's a good idea. Yeah, that's a good idea. Society <laughs> needs more doctors. Yeah, and, and we do, especially in Ghana because uh, so, so many Ghanaian doctors are so good that they get whisked away elsewhere. Sure. Um, but I think the thing that really drew me to philosophy wasn't my father's prediction, it was, which I didn't know about until later. Um, it was that I spent a lot of my time in high school. I, I was in a group of evangelical Christian students at, at my English boarding school. And we read a lot of theology, and then if you read theology, you end up reading philosophy because they're really connected. And um, okay. by the time I got to university, I had read quite a lot of philosophy, more than most people at that age. And it was just the thing that seemed to me most interesting uh, by far. And it wasn't because it helped me think about, you know, being half Ghanaian, half English, that kind of thing. I never found any problem with that myself. I mean, I, we had two wonderful families. My, my, I love my English grandmother. I spent a lot of time with her. She lived next door to my aunt Teresa and her husband, Uncle Robert, and then their children, my cousins. And in Kumasi, we lived near all our cousins and uh, relatives. So I never really felt there was any problem on that level. So the things I got interested in philosophy were actually mainstream philosophical questions about existence and knowledge and not the, not the applied side of philosophy. Yeah.